According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 41 million men and women have served in our nation's military since the American Revolution. Men and women who trained and saluted, many fought and bled. Too many of them never made it back home. And of those who did, many were forever changed. Today, there are roughly 18 million American veterans. That's about 7% of the U.S. population. Our nation made a promise to our veterans to support them and to care for them as they make the transition back to civilian life. Sometimes keeping a promise is easier said than done. But a brand new state-of-the-art VA healthcare clinic in Rapid City is a good start. So as we entered the clinic, uh, we wanted our veterans to be greeted with a very open area. Um, right when they walk in, they're greeted by an information desk that has volunteers from the community uh, that are here to help the veterans. They have access to reception so that they can check in for their appointment and then a very kind of airy waiting area. One of the things that the Rapid City Clinic did that we didn't have over at our previous location at 5th Street is we have on-site VA police here. The really nice thing about having police here is that our veterans and our staff now have 24-hour security services, but our VA police are trained to be part of that veterans care team. They're part of the team. They're trained in de-escalation and really customer service focus. So they're here to provide safety and security, but also assist that veteran. So that was a wonderful addition to have into the clinic. Um, it really opens up the, the clinic to be able to take care of all veterans, especially veterans that need um, more complex care. Sometimes our veterans um, come to the VA and they've had a really rough go lately and they need a lot of comprehensive care with our primary care teams and also our mental health care teams. Some of those veterans weren't able to go out into the community because they were having difficulty working with community partners, disruptive behavior. So we wanted to be able to care for those veterans that were most in need. Um, so by providing 24 or the security here through our VA police department, we're now able to take care of veterans who normally would have had to travel to Fort Meade or Hot Springs to get their care. So we have 21,000 veterans who are eligible for care within the VA Black Hill system. We take care of all those veterans through the use of our two main VA hospitals in Hot Springs and Fort Meade, and then our community-based outpatient clinics that are centrally located across the state in Pier, here in Rapid City, and then you get out into the Panhandle, Nebraska, and Scotts Bluff, uh, Newcastle, and then we're also in Pine Ridge uh, Reservations, just to name a few. So how, what was that number again? 21,000 21, veterans enrolled in VA Black Hills Healthcare. Okay, those are the ones that are enrolled. How many eligible veterans are not enrolled, about but, but should 000. be? Yeah, about, there's about 3,000 veterans that we really want to get the message out that we're here, we want, we want to earn their trust, we want to provide their health care. Um, that is the goal of, of our healthcare delivery system, is to be a trusted um, partner in veterans' health. One of the biggest challenges our veterans face is homelessness. According to the VA, in 2020, there were more than 33,000 homeless veterans. But another organization says that number is low, especially when it comes to the number of homeless vets who are female. Back in 2011, there were a number of studies that were done. In fact, there was a 10-year study from the VA from 9 to 19. They're the fastest growing demographic within homeless veterans. Women veterans have a lot of unique challenges, why they become homeless, getting out of homelessness. Back to that 2011 study, they didn't even study, uh, it, there's actually two different studies, the 10-year the study and then another study from the uh, government accounting agency in 2011, didn't even study homeless vet women veterans. So from that study, resources are developed, so the resources aren't there to address this particular demographic. And that's what complicates the issue over time. Okay, so here's a pie. <laughs> We're doing the pie chart thing. Of all the homeless vets, how big of a slice is female? Well, like I said, nationwide, I, I represent Final Salute, Inc. So nationwide, that's 55,000 on any given day. 
on any given day, 55,000 across the, across the United States. Here in, in Rapid City or here in Western South Dakota, that we, I will tell you and back up a little bit, we have a Black Hills Homeless Consortium, so it's a group of our resources already in place in this area that are much smarter and, and, and follow those specific numbers that are here. I will leave the specific numbers to them, but the challenges are still the same. The challenges that lead to the homelessness, the challenges of, for example, the only shelter of its kind is the Cornerstone Rescue Mission, the only shelter of its kind in Western South Dakota. Now the VA in Hot Springs does have some home, homes, can't, home, can't house children. So those are the challenges that I'm, I'm referring to in, in the pie of, of homelessness. Correct me if I'm wrong, because if you are a homeless female veteran, you may or may not have kids. And so that adds an extra, I don't know, thought process as to how to help, how to get you out of homelessness. Lead me on as far as that goes. So I want to actually tell you a story. Again, top 20 finalists, there's, uh, there's 20 of us in the cohort. Mm -hmm. And all of us are representing homeless women veterans in, in the competition. But in getting to know these beautiful, lovely women beyond the uniform, we are sisters in service, but we're also mothers and wives and daughters. So getting to know their backstory. And I do have permission to talk about this. Uh, there, there's one in the cohort that did find herself homeless. There's another one that was very close to homelessness. So in addressing your question, her story is this. She was active duty, deploying a number of times, unfortunately faced a divorce and a custody battle. So legal issues and legal uh, finances became extreme. And unfortunately, and I can't believe I hear this, this was not in Western South Dakota, by the way, or South Dakota at all. The judge told her, uh, thank you for your service, but we're gonna award custody to her spouse, full custody to her spouse. That was not something that she wanted to accept, of course. So she continued to battle. Those costs of the legal, legal battles led her to becoming very close to, to homelessness herself. So that's just an example of, of some of those unique challenges. Homeless women veterans, there's a couple of studies out there, but over 50% are single mothers. There's another study that, that talks about yeah. half, over half. There are studies that talk between 50 and 80% are single mothers. Rollins says better communication would go a long way to help solve the issue of homeless veterans. Veterans need to be better advocates for themselves when it comes to their health care benefits. And the VA needs to do a better job of informing veterans of what their benefits are. Nobody plans to be homeless. No veteran plans to be homeless. But they don't know of their VA benefits because we don't necessarily talk about it when we're actively serving. VA benefits come after you separate or retire from the military, oftentimes. And so they don't follow those types of benefits. And then also for those, that awareness of people who possibly know of somebody that needs to be linked with those resources. So that's why they don't know to, to self-identify. In my communication with some people that, and some younger, younger airmen of this day, I talk about that now. When we transition and leave the military, separate or retire from the military, it's mandated that we receive a transition assistance program, TAP is what we call it. That's the one and only time that the VA will come to us and tell us their, the benefits that we have. But this is right at the brink of starting their new career or you know transitioning and moving and then and then they fall in hard times they don't necessarily remember that so my passion is to to make sure that all three of those areas those that need the resources those that potentially might need the resources and those people that can also help in their time talent and treasure in in helping those homeless women veterans when that happens 55,000 homeless female veterans and more than half of them are single mothers. Shell shock, battle fatigue, combat neurosis, post-traumatic stress disorder. Whatever you call it, it's another challenge that veterans sometimes deal with. 
here's one of the most important things to understand. You know, a lot of our treatments, a lot of our therapies, a lot of how we've, we've kind of handled the problem in the past is, you know, change your thoughts. If you change your thoughts, you'll be better. When, when you've been traumatized, that doesn't happen to just your brain. It happens to your body, okay? And what you want to do is you want to engage the body and the mind when you do these things. Tra trauma is really interesting or PTSD is really interesting because a lot of us have had traumatic memories and what you know is the memory is way back there. You don't think about it anymore like, like, like it's gone. It's not, no longer occupying space in your mind. But PTSD doesn't work like this and this is the hard thing for a family member trying to help somebody out with P PTSD is those types of traumatic memories, especially if you understand how the limbic system works, our amygdala works, our amygdala is responsible for our fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, part of our brain. Yep, yep. So it's a very small part of the brain, okay? But because a signal hits that before the higher order parts of the brain, we can get hijacked by that amygdala. That's why it, it's so vexing because you know what you're doing is illogical, but in that moment, you, you, don't, you don't know it. Is that what they call the reptilian brain? Yes, yes. Okay. It's a lizard bar brain, oldest part of the bra brain. Uh, it's what we have in common with our an animal cousins and stuff like and that. And that just kind of takes over. That takes over. Wow. Urban says when you're dealing with PTSD, you're often dealing with a lot of other things as well. There's a lot of things that kind of come with PTSD. Um, lost, lost relationships, very, very common because uh, <laughs> uh, we, we can't trust anybody. And so you, you deal a lot with the relationship as uh, issues, but you also deal with co-occurring problems, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, okay? And, and by, the, by the way, substance abuse is oftentimes misinterpreted as a moral failing, okay? I've, I've been doing this work a long time, and most people are, are just trying to find a way to numb and deal with effectively the demons in their head, you know? And I get it, drugs, alcohol, bad. But when I can't sleep, when I can't function at all without the thing, then it's the lesser of two evils. And so first and foremost, we have to, get, we have to give veterans the tools to cope with their problems because if they can't cope with their problems then they just go right back to the substance issue. Is it possible for someone, and I don't care if it's male or female, to go through a, a trauma in their life to trigger that PTSD and then go into the military and then the whole thing just kind of gets blown way out of proportion. Does that ever happen? Yeah, yeah, and what, by the way, what you're referring to is, is something called complex PTSD. And what, what that is, is, you know, sometimes we have these singular events. You know, there was a combat situation. Um, I saw my buddy die. And, and from that, you know, I have a hard time sleeping because of that singular event. That's usually rarer than what you're referring to because, you know, so, sometimes I, I, was, I was hit, I was beaten as a kid. You know, maybe I had an abusive par parent and a, or a series of bad circumstances where, where I was a child. And so you have that baggage and then you go into the military and you have subsequent events that, you know, like the example that I gave, just reinforce this idea that I'm not safe. And so again, that's, that's really complex PTSD. And it's kind of often what we really see, see is that like it's not just these singular events, it's a multitude of events across the lifespan. Now, you can picture a, 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 young, a young boy growing up in uh, South Dakota, okay? Rural communities, life is good, it's safe. You know, you know, typical Amer Americana. It's wholesome. It's wholesome. Uh, leave, it, leave it to Beaver <laughs> if I'm aging myself, okay? But then you decide to serve your country, you know? You want to do good for your country. And you go across the sea and you witness the worst of humanity. And maybe you do things that are completely against your nature out of orders or out of the mess that is being in, in a combat situation. And because of that, you have something not only related to the traumatic event experience of yourself, 
but maybe a deeper narrative that says, you know, I can't trust myself, I can't trust God, I can't trust my country, you know, all, all of these different things that, that are morally injurious to, to kind of the soul. One family that knows the heartache of dealing with PTSD and everything that comes with it is the Durr family of New Underwood. Their son Colton took his own life in April of 2012 after completing 500 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Like a lot of our soldiers that come home, uh, you know, everybody is glad to have you home. And obviously have a, if you have a physical injury, people notice that right away, but it's that hidden, uh, little hidden mental issue in the mental health aspect that is uh, really still not talked about a lot. And uh, post-traumatic stress amongst our soldiers that have deployed is uh, pretty, uh, pretty traumatic to deal with. And it's a battle they deal with every day. Did you have any indication that Colton was suffering uh, mentally from anything or any way? Yes, because, okay. you know, uh, with a background in law enforcement and being in Iraq for over three years, I recognized, you know, that he had some of these issues when he came home, which most of us all do. I mean, anybody that's deployed, uh, you know, and again, a lot of the soldiers come back and it's that transition coming back home. And sometimes, you know, they plug in okay. And uh, then uh, there's that battle of the mental health. And so Cold and I talked about it. I said a lot of what you're experiencing, you know, coming back home, how you think, what you're perceiving, you know, just a little bit uh, jumpy about stuff. I said that's all normal. So, so you and I, you and Colton would talk about it, and he would explain exactly what he was experiencing, what he was going through. Correct. Okay. Yep. It was pretty, pretty direct conversations because you know. Uh, we just had that relationship that I wasn't going to let it go. Coming home, it is a bit of a, you know, getting your boots back on uh, civilian soil is a little bit difficult. But if some of these things continue, then we need to really talk about it. And in Colton's case, they did continue. And so even when Colton was down at Fort Hood, then I pushed him to go through his military chain of command and say, hey, you know, uh, I need a little bit of help. And uh, he sought that through the military, and it really wasn't supported that well. So he wasn't getting a lot of support through the military on his mental health. And uh, then he uh, went up to Fort Drum, and probably about four to five months before he deployed to Afghanistan, <clears throat> I had you know straight talk with him again and said, I don't think you're in a good place. And he said, no, I'm not. And uh, at that point in time, I mean, it was pretty hard on him. He was depressed, uh, suicidal. And uh, so anyway, I said, well, one more time, let's try the chain of command. So Colton went to his leadership. He was a platoon sergeant. <clears throat> and he went to his leadership and said, you know, I need to get some help because I'm just going to kind of flag myself. I'm not in a good place. He just started some counseling sessions through the military chain of command about I'm going to say probably four months prior to deployment and Colton was not one of those guys, you know, and no soldier that is seeking mental health is saying, I don't want to deploy. They're just saying, I need some help to be squared away to deploy, squared away to live. And uh, anyway, at that point in time, uh, he just got to less than a handful of counseling sessions in and his uh, brigade headquarters said, enough of that. Uh, you are too mission critical and so you're going to deploy. It wasn't a question of him deploying, it was a question of him getting help. They actually wrote on his mental health paperwork where it said he was depressed and suicidal, suffered PTSD. Uh, the command wrote over the top of that and said, we will monitor soldier in theater, he will deploy. These conversations that were dark and heavy and real uh, were between Colton and I, and I did not share them. And uh, so when, you know, when Colton died, you know, then there was, uh, I should have said this, I should have done that with, you know, his family members and friends, even soldiers that Colton was with that he just went to visit had no idea. 
you know, they thought he was, uh, you know, of great spirit, great mind, and, uh, you know, everything was okay. And it wasn't until a few days before Colton took his life that he started to, you know, just go dark and just shut down. And, uh, you know, um, even the night, you know, would have been the day that Colton died, you know, I just, uh, and he was getting quiet and I'm just, you know, trying to prop him up and going, you know, we're going to get through this. And I sent him a prayer basically that just said, you know, God, I want you to take all of my son's pain away from him and give it to me. And I asked Colton to say this prayer. And uh, that was our last communication. Sometimes something good can come from a tragedy. After Colton's death, Jerry Durr put together the Sergeant Colton Levi Durr Foundation. The goal of the organization is to raise awareness of PTSD and TBI, traumatic brain injury. Integrating back into civilian life can be a struggle for a lot of veterans and there's no easy fix. So it takes help from everyone, from the government, the VA, the community, employers, neighbors, church members, and the vet's own families. A lot of it comes down to what I tell everybody really, just try to be kind in your heart and not judgmental and just try to listen. And really across the board is so much upheaval in our communities and across the nation about multiple things. You know, that has an impact on everybody and you can have a big impact on somebody just by being kind and uh, just being able to listen. If you or someone you know is dealing with PTSD, you need to get help. Call 988 and then press 1. Taking care of our veterans here in West 605.